name is leveraging commercial capabilities for climate action on the SDG through uh, mapping and air observation. Uh, 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 the organization to win this session is a World U Special Industry Council, WGIC. Uh, we are expecting uh, the session to cover, among other things, of course, the contribution of the winning project to SDG, climate mitigation and adaptation, the uh, prospects of uh, replicability, scalability, and sustainability beyond the country where these projects are initiated. And uh, potential future research area to extend these projects, uh, what we call the next wave of generation. I will leave uh, Ms. Barbara to lead this session. I'm just introducing the session for the benefits of the audience. Mr. Barbara, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thanks. I'll try that one. Well, thank you very, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, great, thanks. Appreciate that. Yep. Um, and it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to extend our deepest appreciation to Ag Fund and Badia for this project. This is really quite significant for the World Geospatial Industry Council, as it's our uh, first. Uh, source of external funding that comes in in addition. Our primary source is membership dues from our companies. You'll see them later. So this is really a substantial step forward. So thank you so much for that. Uh, my name is Barbara Ryan and I'm executive director of the World Geospatial Industry Council. And like uh, you heard, what we'd like to spend some time talking about is increasing the role of the private sector in advancing climate action. This entire event over the next two weeks is largely a government game. It is parties that come to the table. And what you will see from this presentation and also our presenters up here, that we are sub-optimizing climate action if we are only relying on government assets. Now I can tell you, I'm a 40 year public servant, and those government assets are essential, but we can now bring greater uh, tools, services, and data to the table with the contributions of the private sector, and that's what we're here to talk about. So um, you're not only going to hear a couple slides from me on WGIC, but you're going to hear from Robert Hodenbach from Fugro, Stefan Germain from GHGSAT, and Atier Javad from Planet here on the stage with me. Each of them will have a short presentation about their individual company contributions to this really important topic. But before we get started, I think it's really important to go back to a quote from the 1400s uh, from Leonardo da Vinci that says, we must realize that everything connects to everything else. And when we look at the entire Earth system, it doesn't matter which of these constructs you want to use, but the atmosphere, the oceans, the lands, everything is connected to itself. And what you will see is that our member companies are collecting data and or providing services in every single one of those domains. And if we want to address climate action, we've got to realize that everything is connected to everything else. And I think this graphic does a good job of saying that. We are a global trade association. So while WGIC is a not-for-profit organization, should I use this instead? Maybe that, is that a little bit better, you guys? Okay. While we are not-for-profit, you must be 
a private sector company working in geospatial and earth observations to join WGIC. And these are our member companies, many of whom will be here at the COP. Just take a look at these. These are many of the big and emerging actors in geospatial technologies and earth observations. And the three that you will hear from today, as I said, are FUGRO, GHGSAT, and PLANET. We've got three very simple goals. We want to strengthen the contributions of this sector to society and the global economy. We want to advance global policy matters. And of course, we want to create business opportunities for our members. Now, when we talk about uh, strengthening the contribution to society and the global economy, what you will see on the bo bottom of this graph are really the major policy agendas that are out there globally. So whether it's the Paris Agreement, what we're discussing at the COP, whether it's the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, or whether it's the Sustainable Development Goals, of which we got the award for goal number 13, it's important across all of those policy mandates that we strengthen the contributions of the commercial sector. So again, we have adopted climate as an overarching topic for our organization. And again, we are so happy to have received the third category project from Ag Fund and uh, Badea for leveraging commercial capabilities for climate action through those sustainable development goals. What led to that award was a project that I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking about because while it's a very uh, relatively narrow project, it speaks to the importance of what's happening here. We worked with former U.S. Vice President Al Gore's Climate Trace Initiative and Watt Time and the Group on Earth Observations in preparing a report that looked at public sector, private sector, and hybrid missions for greenhouse gas monitoring from space. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first time a report like this was put together. And it's not so important that you look at the database, but what you will see here is that carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide are those three greenhouse gases that this convention pays attention to, and we looked at who's doing what for all of those gases. What we found is that blue is shown in public sector, private sector is shown in red, and hybrid missions are shown in green. What this graph will show you is that for the 1990s and for the 2000s, 100% of those missions were from our public sector space agencies. As we came into the next decade, you started to see the emergence of the private sector. And as we look out into the next decade, you're going to see public sector, private sector, and actually hybrid missions where the public sector and private sector are coming together in about a third, a third, a third of that entire composition. So a really interesting graphic just for uh, greenhouse gases. We can look at those gases that were measured, whether it was carbon dioxide, methane, or nitrous oxide. Same thing, public-private hybrid. We can look at the scale in which that data is collected. What you will see is it's still your national governments that are largely collecting a lot of global data. But as you start to scale down to the country level or either site-specific level, that's where you will really see the capability of the commercial sector bear. And so for governments that have to report back at their level, it is absolutely essential that this data come in as part of the equation. And again, whether it's by country, so you can look at countries across the table here and again see who's got public missions, who's got private missions, and who's got hybrid missions. The messages that we delivered to COP26 in Glasgow is 
you need both. You need, you've got to continue to invest in your public spec sector space agencies, NASA, ESA, CNES, JAXA, across the board. You've got to put policies in place that are more open to allowing private sector contributions into this equation, and you will do a better job of addressing your climate mandates if you can get that entire system working. So this is just a little baby step into greenhouse gas monitoring, but what the prize will allow us to do is expand that analysis for either additional parameters that can be measured from space or to include all of the capabilities that you're going to see just from this sample of our member companies. And again, go back to all our 34 or 35 companies because all of them very much want to help advance climate action. So my address and my email is here. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to, uh, I'll minimize this, and Robert, you're going to be uh, up uh, first. So Fugro, let me uh, pull you up right there. And how's that? Is it? Oh, we got to get it on uh, maybe projection. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Shall we see if this uh, works, maybe? Uh, <coughs> yeah, is it, is, is it better? Okay. No, yeah, we're all fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I want to talk today about uh, fear and the fear of not understanding, and hence also my title, Here Be Dragons No More. Um, and how we fear not understanding things and how mapping a geospatial industry can help actually by better understanding. And if you look at this map, this is the first map that was ever made of Africa, uh, full Africa, 15th century. And in the old days, if cartographers did not understand what was there, they would call it terra incognito, unknown territory. They would paint lions or dragons there. And they would say, here there will be dragons. You should fear what you don't know. In the case of Africa, you can see, they actually painted a cyclops. Uh, that, that was the type of fear. And what I want to talk about today is that although we don't have that much terra incognito anymore, in climate action, we actually have a lot of unknowns locally. And how do we adapt to climate change? And as you can hear, I'm a map maker and I love map making. And map making um, is what I do for Fugro, the company I represent, but also for the WGIC. And map making has always been associated with military, with political in the last century, with economic growth. But I really hope in the 20th, 21st century, it will be associated with supporting climate change, understanding climate change, and adapting to climate change. So you might say, okay, there's a lot of geospatial information already around. So you might know this picture. These are the essential climate variables that go into the IPCC report. 50% uh, of them are actually um, covered by remote sensing uh, and geospatial technology. But the um, interest that we have and the focus of this talk today is really how do we bring that overarching information that we have about climate change really to local adaptation, to local knowledge. How do we connect it with, with, uh, with, the, with the, the boots on the ground, actually? And this is where the geospatial industry comes in. And the best way of doing that is via spatial digital twins. So if you want to be able to really action and you want to monitor and you want to plan and act on changes, you build a geospatial or a spatial digital twin. And a digital twin, and I'm not the only one talking about that, I already heard a few conferences here where they were talking about building digital twins, either for the oceans or for climate digital twins, is not some kind of fancy uh, gimmick, some futuristic gimmick. It's not the metaverse, it could be. But um, I think it's, that's overdone. 
I mean, in the simplest definition, it's really a digital or virtual representation of a physical uh, environment. And in the simplest form, it would be a model or a map to actually say something about uh, sea level rising, about coastal erosion, about uh, energy, energy transition. And that's what we're after. But first, and without becoming too technical, um, and I focus my presentation on Africa, as we, as we are on the COP for Africa here, um, we, have, we have 30 years of experience working in Africa. And a lot of uh, terra incognito still exists actually in Africa in the foundational uh, realm. Actually, we're still building ge geodetic networks to make sure that the ownership, uh, cadastral uh, uh, land ownership is being arranged. We still uh, build uh, geoid or gravital modeling. And you, would, you might think, what is that about? But if you want to build a flood model, you need to know what the gravity around the Earth is. So we do those kind of fundamental uh, type of work, and then we obviously train the people to work with that. But once you have the uh, fundamentals in place, you can start really build a digital twin. And the good thing about the digital twin is, is that you can add to that spatial component all kinds of, of variables. So you can look at the quality of coral reefs, you can look at the erosion of coast, you can look at uh, the resilience of infrastructure, uh, all those kind of uh, elements that will be impacted by climate change. And once you have the simplest form of a digital twin, uh, with the affordable uh, technology that's around nowadays, and the technology that's, that, that is actually ubiquitous, it's all, all around, once you have the simplest form, it is a gift that keeps on giving. You can keep on adding information, you can keep on modeling, simulating and predicting eventually what will happen to, uh, to your environment. And I want to show a few examples uh, of, of those uh, digital twins. So what you see here is the island of uh, St. Martin in the Caribbean and we have similar models for, for many of the small island states around the world where we did very detail, detailed mapping of both the uh, seafloor and of the topography to make uh, uh, detailed flood modeling. And the difference with maybe uh, the, the rough flood modeling you typically see is that it makes a difference of where do you exactly build, where don't you build, where do you adapt to climate change. And these kind of examples uh, show that the, um, uh, the necessity of bringing that global information, that very rough information down to a local level and adding that with local knowledge uh, to understand where, uh, where you need to adapt and where you don't. And then also, once you have that model, you can use it for m more mundane activities, like tax collection, for example, or uh, cadastral information, or uh, other kind of municipal uh, 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 um, uh, benefits. Another example brings us to the other side of the world. This is, um, and I don't know if the movie is working. Yeah, it is. <coughs> It brings us to the other side of the world. This is, um, this is a cyclone Martian 2015 on, in Queensland. And this shows once you have a digital twin, um, you can very quickly recuperate from disasters because you know how the situation was before. And if you acquire data afterwards, you can respond quickly. So in this case, actually Queensland was out of electricity only for a few days, whereas the cyclone before, it took weeks to get uh, electricity back on. But if you have these kind of models, um, you can also uh, avoid other disasters like bushfires, for example, are a big problem in a large part of the world. And these kind of models are currently supporting Australia, the US, and all kinds of southern European countries in avoiding bushfires that are induced by electricity networks. The third element, which is particularly uh, important for, for a lot of developing countries, is about grid modernization. Making sure that your grid can be, can be actually understood and adapted to the adoption of renewables. And if you don't understand what your network is about, you cannot uh, uh, include renewables. So you will need to have that understanding. And here you see the data before and after, and it gives a very clear depiction of where disaster hit, where you need to respond, how do you uh, prioritize uh, your, your response. And the last example that I will give, and uh, then I'll, I'll uh, wrap it up, is the um, uh, city of uh, Houston, the uh, work that we do with the Advanced uh, uh, Research Center in Houston, where you use these digital twins 
for, uh, for other municipal applications like cold heat planning, microgrids for example. So again, it's a gift that keeps on giving. So how um, can we, uh, how can we um, really become, how can we get to action? So there's three elements I think that are important, certainly in developing countries. So first of all, enable historical and local data. There's a lot of data available. And with the help of, uh, of geospatial companies or with the help of the council, we can invent, do an inventory of what is available and where you can already build uh, a, a, um, a action package from the data that is there. Secondary, there's a lot of existing projects. A lot of projects that you saw, for example, St. Martin, they were actually added on to, an aero, uh, to a nautical charting exercise or to an infrastructure exercise. There's a lot of projects that are acquiring data. Let's add to that the climate resilience questions. And then thirdly, let's leverage the international and local knowledge and bring that together. And this is what we're really after with the World, uh, uh, Indus or World Geospatial Industry Council. So I want to thank you for your attention. And if you want to reach out to me, you can use that QR code. So thank you very much. Robert, thanks uh, for that. All right, we are uh, going to go to um, uh, Stefan next, and I'll uh, do my best to pull up um, your slideshow, uh, I guess, I'm trying to do that. Uh, that's Planet, now I need, uh, here we go. Uh, and then I guess right here, right? Good, there all right. Go. Thank you. So my name is Stefan Germain. I'm the CEO of a company called GHGSAT. And uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm going, to, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to talk to you using one slide. That's all you're going to see. But I'm going to walk you through it because there's lots of different elements on that that are really important. So what we do is very much along the lines of uh, what the winning report actually uh, the, the won the Ag Fund uh, third prize. Uh, covered, which is monitoring of greenhouse gas emissions using satellites. And that's what we do. That's all we do. So we use our own satellites, we have six in orbit today, to monitor greenhouse gas emissions around the world. The, each satellite can monitor down to individual facility levels. So that means we can see whether an oil well is emitting, whether a power plant is emitting, whether a landfill is emitting, a coal mine, so any type of large industrial emission source of carbon dioxide or methane is what we target and that's what we measure and then we work with the operators of those facilities to help them understand where, where, how big their emissions are, where their emissions are and then work with them to, over time as they put in mitigation efforts to track them and reduce them. And that's our goal. So we work at the facility level at high resolution with each individual facility, literally everywhere in the world, with different operators, and then with their governments. We also work with the governments that uh, support and regulate, in some cases, each one of the operators. And then finally, we work also with any other stakeholder that is interested in those emissions. So we'll sell data to anybody, meaning you know we've worked with everything from NGOs through to um, the financial services markets, who are also interested in tracking emissions by individual facility. So what you're looking at in this one slide is examples of those kind of measurements at the resolution you would see from our satellites. Well, every pixel that you see on there is 25 meters by 25 meters, and the color that you see overlaid on a visual image is concentrations of methane. So the, of the two primary, green, well, the two major greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, methane is actually the more important one in the short term. On a 20-year scale, one ton of methane is equivalent to 82 tons of carbon dioxide. So if you can fix one ton of methane, 
you've got a lot more bang for your effort, for your buck, so to speak, than you do if you're just trying to fix carbon dioxide. I'm not saying we should ignore carbon dioxide, it's very important. But really, there's a lot of companies that are trying to understand their, their methane first. And the other thing about methane is, if I only had a visual map up there, you would see nothing. You would see no color because methane is transparent, has no odor, right? So you can't see it in nature. So it's really important to have the instruments, to have the technology to detect it so you can help the operators find their leaks and fix them. So what you're looking at here is actually oil and gas leaks. So there's uh, five and actually six different leaks that are each identified with a pin where you're seeing the concentrations of methane blowing downwind. So the wind, imagine, is coming from the, the top left of the slide and going towards the bottom right. And you're seeing the concentrations decrease from red, which is the highest concentrations, down to yellow and blue and green. And from those concentration patterns, we can then determine what the emission rate is at the source. And that's what people really care about at the end of the day. They want to take all those emission rates, add them up, and, real, and, and understand what their total inventories are, how much of a a carbon footprint they've got in their operations. And they want to drive those down to zero. So on this map, we can tell exactly which facility is leaking and how much it's leaking. And that's what operators need to know to fix their emissions. So the other thing I'm going to point out about this one slide <laughs> is that it is presented in a uh, platform that we call Spectra, which is the, the title on the top left, it's a little cut off, S-P-E-C-T-R-A. So we have a free version of Spectra. You can go look at spectra-basic.ghgsat.com, sign up and you get access to free global concentration data of methane and lots of examples like this to show you what this looks like in a town or a facility near you. And then, of course, we have higher resolution data, more frequent data. Uh, you can actually task our satellites to go look at specific facilities that interest you. And that, of course, is paid services, which are delivered through a, a, an upgrade on the Spectra portal that we have. So that is available now worldwide. With our six satellites, we can see any place in the world roughly every two, two to three days. We're launching another six satellites next year. So that means we'll be able to see any place in the world approximately every day. And we're currently closing on funding for raising, a, for, for deploying 100 satellites. Now, why 100 satellites? Because we want to be able to see every single facility in the world every day for carbon dioxide and methane. We want to have so much data on every single facility in the world that now every operator in the world will want to work with us they already do want to work with us, but will have no choice really to work with us in order to understand what their emissions look like. So not only do we combine our data in Spectra, we also take public satellite data. So satellite data that's available from European Space Agency satellites, for example, right now that have different capabilities. We also put those on in layers within Spectra. So really within Spectra, we want to be able to provide every single source of greenhouse gas satellite data in one place for customers, for third parties who want to see free data, it's all there and available now. All right, so with that, um, you know, we very much look forward to contributing to the ongoing work of the World Geospatial Industry Council in greenhouse gas satellites, and uh, certainly that's all we do. We're focused entirely on that, and I think we, we hope to be able to make a great contribution not just to that report, but obviously to reducing emissions worldwide. Thanks. Thank you, Stefan. Nice job. Last but not least, we're going to have uh, Ate come back up and, um, and talk from a, a planet perspective. And so let's minimize this and pull up, um, pull up your presentation, Ate. Yes, here's close to your mouth. And it's actually going to be Atia presenting. Go yes. right ahead. Oh, All right. Hi. I have it. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the role of the private sector really to help in social enterprises for climate change as well. And I'm focusing my presentation today on Africa, like everyone else in the audience did. Um, 
But let me start um, a little bit with talking about our satellites and where our satellites are coming from. So when you look in the beginning of creating those Earth observation satellites, we had the public sector really engaging for over 30 years, building out satellites that were humongous. They were large. And what Planet did was miniaturized that entire um, satellite systems to build hundreds of them, like you said, the GHGsat, so that you're able, and I'm going to show you in the next slide, how we're able to monitor daily information of satellite, of, of landmarks every single day. Hopefully this video works. Um, so what really happens, I'm going to press play, is it? Oh. Okay. Interruption, intermission. <laughs> so, um, my name is Atiyah Jabat, and I'm responsible, I'm leading our business development team for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. I focus a lot on the Middle East right now and uh, topics like desertification, afforestation, etc. Here we are, our Dove satellite. So as the Earth rotates, we have our smaller satellites that are 30 centimeter, 10 centimeter, and 10 centimeter that go around the Earth taking every place, taking images of every place of the Earth. So you have this large amount of data set that, that's being created of every place of the Earth, always on, all the time. And then we have another set of satellites that are called our SkySat satellites, where if you want to zoom in to a certain place on the Earth, you can toss the satellite uh, for up to 10 times a day. So we've just like multiplied the amount of data you can have to be able to make larger trends uh, for, for the Earth. So let's go to the next slide. keeps going back to GHGs. <laughs> okay, the next slide. Yeah, so what, the, what, what happens right now is that you have a lot of data that's collected, and for each place of the Earth, you almost have 2,000 images that you can create trends out of. So you, you absolutely need an, an AI platform that's creating these trends for you. You have 30 megabytes of data that has been captured, a terabyte, sorry, of data that's captured every single day, and of 300 million square kilometers of Earth. So basically, this whole flight of satellites is providing you this data which is readily available every single day to you. And what that does is allows for global public good data sets to become available to you. And I want to talk a little bit more on our NICFI program because that affects Africa and how we are dealing with Africa. But we also have our Allen Coral Atlas, so looking at Earth mass and like the land mass on Earth, as well as really looking at our coastal regions to understand the coral reefs since we are here in a coral bay area. Um, where you can find out classifications of the corals that exist around your um, islands. So let me go into uh, details of our NICFI program. So the NICFI program is actually an unprecedented partnership that you could have between uh, the Norwegian government, the Norwegian International Climate for and Forest Initiative, as well as several other private players. It, it wouldn't have been possible if the Norwegian government hadn't supported 64 countries across Africa and the tropical regions to understand deforestation trends. So, I'm on the next slide. Um, IT? Is 
it's showing here, yeah. I guess my video was the one. So this, this is her next slide, which shows here, but it's this shows the projector was stuck on the last slide. I should have had one slide. <laughs> Copy GHG slide. <laughs> okay, maybe we start it again. Sure, maybe you can do it, I don't know. You don't? Okay. Yeah. Should I just like... But that's, that's fine, it should open. Is it showing? I don't see it. Oh, great. So you can learn my slides by heart by now. It's for everyone in the audience that's really paying attention to my slides. So, so this is what I wanted to show you. When a government supported, supports you, you have now available data sets for 64 countries across the entire forest, tropical forest of the world. And all of a sudden, you're able to make a lot of new calculations. And our program was so successful that within a year, and it only took us one year to have 10,000 registered students, uh, researchers, NGOs, and users that were able to come from 132 different countries, private sector as well, to create trends that are going on in, the, in forestry. I'm going to repeat that, the impacts really. We have over 300 success stories. We have 132 registered countries. And we're actually giving out monthly base maps of areas across these 64 countries. I want to touch upon this small example of floods in, in Africa, and then I'll stop. Um, so when you have a daily data set, this is like, I want you to look at what is on the bottom of uh, the images. So April 21st, you weren't, there was no floods. Um, on April 24th, three days later, there was a flood that happened on the Tanga River. And this is around the river, all the areas got flooded. So you were able to see much of it on the map here. But I want to go closer and show you. And I want you to focus on Garissa, the, uh, the small city there. You cannot see so much more there. But 9th of May, the floods have still gone on. They've expanded. You see what's happening on a daily basis. And, and of course, on our satellites, where you have, uh, you, you'll be able to see the next best image based on the cloud cover, because Africa is also very cloudy. And I want to finish this with having your daily images. You're able to detect the number of houses that were damaged, the number of roads that were swept away, and how many people actually were affected during the flood. So um, that's pretty much for me. And here you can see, um, contact me on atiatplanet.com. Thank you. And thank you for your patience with the IT folks. At Atiyah, thanks. Thanks so much for that. And actually, thanks to each of the speakers, Robert, Safain, Atia. Okay, we'd love to uh, open it up for any questions that anybody uh, might have. And also, I'm looking in the front row, and some of the prize committee uh, is here. So thank you very much uh, for acknowledging the work that we've done. Questions from anybody? Aga. <laughs> Yeah, I would just like to um, go back, uh, Barb, to what you were saying in the middle, uh, in the beginning, that um, this event is mostly, obviously it's been traditionally focused on governments, and, and it's opening up a little bit. You know, you see obviously civil society here, but also industry coming through um, uh, various avenues. Do you think that's going to be happening more? Um, do you think that governments are um, listening uh, to what these other sectors have to say? Are we really 
making an impact by being here or are we just doing it because we're trying, but are we really making a dent? Yeah, yeah thanks, Aga. And Aga's also with uh, Plan and our primary contact into the World Geospatial Industry Council. So thanks for that, Aga. You know, one, it's a good question, and it's actually a, a quite a tough question for me. We're, we're making progress, but it's, it's slow. Still, I'm hearing kind of an echo there. Um, is that's better? Okay. And I guess I'm, I'm hesitant to say, but when I think about when even the Conference of the Party started, you know, we're on our 27th one right now. So we've been at this for almost, governments have been at it for almost 30 years. And so that says to me that something's got to change. And I think the fact that they know it's got to change, they're being more open to this. I think it definitely helped that WGIC was a not-for-profit organization and had a little bit easier chance, say, presenting this report, the GHG, sat, the GHG report, of which GHG sat participated last year. Um, I think the Ag Fund Prize will help immensely, but we just need to keep we need to keep doing it. If you happen to hear Al Gore's talk uh, earlier in the week, I mean, he said to all the parties, you've got to open the door, not only to private financing, but to actual private sector capabilities, and I'm hoping that will have an effect. The only other thing I'll say, and probably every single one of you will attest to this, it's not easy engaging in the process. I mean. 45,000 people here, how many pavilions? So even on the WGIC side, I think we need to be more organized next year and get a much earlier start because you need to get credentials and that may have to come from your national governments. I mean, we've just got to kind of take a look at this whole, ses whole process, not just on the government side, but I think on the private sector side too. And I'll just say one more thing because, you know, we're going to have a board meeting in uh, February. And I think what the officers would really like to hear from are each one of the member companies who have participated in the COP to say, what do we need to do differently? So we'll look to advice from you guys for that meeting in February. We got some ideas. Okay, good, <laughs> good. Thanks. Anybody else? Yes, yeah, Stefan. Yeah, maybe I, maybe I heard the question differently, but I'll, I'll answer it differently anyway. So what kind of impact are we having? Was that kind of the general question? So I, I'm actually really excited about the impact that we can create. And so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do, we do obviously. But uh, so we're, we've already proven that when you can show people what they're emitting, they will act. So we've had, and, and I'm sure you've seen that with deforestation as well, right? And when you show, when you show governments or maybe even companies what they're doing, they, they will act, either the governments or the companies. So I'll give you one example. Um, I'll give you two examples. So one is uh, working with, I know it's not very popular today, but with oil and gas companies in Iraq. We've been doing that for the last six months, uh, working to, to map all the emission sources in Iraq and then identify where the large emission sources and then send the data to the operators to let them know, look, did you realize you were emitting? and then send people in to train them about what we're seeing, what we think could be fixed, because a lot of these problems can typically be fixed very quickly. One emission, just one, and we're working on several others in Iraq right now, one emission was shut down, it's equivalent to 750,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. All right, that's, like, that's like taking a, uh, a couple hundred thousand cars off the road, one emission. All right, so that, that's working with an operator. I'll give you another story where we worked with uh, three different ambassadors <laughs> in a Central Asian country that shall remain nameless, uh, where we found what was called an unlit flare. An unlit flare is when uh, typically when you have excess gas, you're going to burn it, and it turns into carbon dioxide, which is a less of an impact on the climate than just venting methane. And so we, we tried to get a hold of that operator. We could not. This, this, this country would just not even open the doors and it would not respond to the mail, would do nothing. So we're from Canada, so I went to the Canadian ambassador. The Canadian ambassador tried, he didn't get anywhere. Called his buddy, the U.S. ambassador. U.S. ambassador went in, 
and managed to get to the presidential envoy for oil and gas to that country, brought in the European ambassador, and the three of them together managed to get that one leak shut down. One leak, only one leak, five million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. That's a million cars off the road. All right, so we're coming up on 10 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent mitigated, and we're just a small company just getting started. That's why we want to launch 100 satellites. So I, I'm, I'm actually very enthusiastic about the impact we can have, like today, right now. These are great examples. I, I would like to add to, <coughs> something to that as well. I think in principle, the private sector is very action-oriented. Huh? So, so if we are not action-oriented, we're dead in the water. Um, and sometimes it creates a bit of friction with uh, the complexity of uh, uh, climate policies. And to be honest, I mean, what we f f see as a more traditional company trying to transition into, uh, into the climate field is that there's quite a lot of hurdles, quite a lot of time and effort spent until you get to the projects that I showed in the movies uh, before. And then it's all a matter in this economy of opportunity cost. Huh? Where are you going to spend your effort, time and talent? And we want to spend it here, huh? don't get me wrong. But, but it's sometimes easier for companies, private sector, to spend it somewhere else. And, and what we need to make sure of is that it becomes more ef effective for companies to actually work together and create shared value. I think I want to add there, um, like you said, the opportunity cost. We also can join forces with other private sector companies, and we've done this this time at COP as well to, uh, to announce with Microsoft. We signed a partnership to announce our extension for global AI for good. And we're working together for Egypt as well as um, Kenya right now. Those are the two countries we expanded to. Another example is to work together with the Global Renewable Watch. So I think like coming together as a private sector and also being representative here in many collaborations and partnerships often can help the, go the government see that we are taking action and we are serious about it as well. Yeah, Ati, I think that's a really good point because actually in each one of your presentations, uh, as the next person was presenting, I was thinking, oh, it'd be kind of nice if that was part of that and vice versa. So yeah, I think that is important. Um, any other, other questions? Anything? No? All right. Well, you guys, we won't hold you any more than necessary, um, but I just want to, again, want to thank each of you for joining here, and thank you, everybody in the audience, for coming. Um, if you, we can make the slides available if you want them. If you didn't get our contact information for any of the people, we can give you email addresses. Just feel free to address them after, uh, after the event. Thank you very much.